Hello and welcome another episode of The Nonprofit Show. Today we are already fired up for our conversation that we're about to have with Jake Wood. Jake is a CEO and founder at Groundswell and he joins us thanks to our sponsor, Staffing Boutique, Katie Warnick, uh, with the referral and introduction. He's here to talk to us about the intersection of DAFs and corporate philanthropy. So I'm excited uh, to have this juicy and spicy conversation. But before we jump into it, we want to remind you, our viewers and our listeners, who you are looking at or possibly listening to. So hello to Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. And I'm Jarrett Ransom, Julia's personal nonprofit nerd, but I can be yours too. CEO of the Raven Group and really honored to serve alongside Julia for these conversations We would not be here at 721 episodes. I looked at the spreadsheet before we went live uh, if it weren't for our amazing sponsors. So again, a huge shout out to our friends over at Bloomering, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, Be Generous, Fundraising Academy, and National University. Another shout out for Katie at Staffing Boutique, (laughs) the Nonprofit Thought Leader, as well as Nonprofit Nerd. So these companies keep us going and growing moving right along with our episodes here at the nonprofit show. And if you missed any of them by now, you probably know where to find them, but it's on all of the fantastic streaming platforms, which include Roku, YouTube, Fire TV, Vimeo, and podcasts. So go ahead and cue us up wherever you stream your entertainment. And this conversation with Jake Wood will be on these platforms in just a few couple of hours. But until then, we're going to go live and ha- are live and having this amazing conversation. So Jake Wood, CEO, founder at Groundswell, welcome. Hey, thank you for having me. Looking forward to the conversation. You know, you have such a fascinating history, Jake, that has led <clears throat> you to Groundswell to start this, this platform. Talk to us about your journey to Groundswell. Yeah, uh, you know, it's it, it was not a natural path to becoming a fintech entrepreneur. Um, I started out in the Marine Corps, uh, served overseas, Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, Marine Corps infantry. Uh, after that, I accidentally started a nonprofit organization in 2010 called Team Rubicon. Um, you know, really inauspicious beginnings, uh, but it, it scaled really dramatically uh, and continues to thrive today. It's an organization that responds to disasters and humanitarian crises. Uh, primarily using military veterans. We've got about 150,000 volunteers around the world uh, responding to complex disaster and humanitarian scenarios. Um, And so I know a thing or two about the nonprofit journey and uh, the struggles and the opportunities in the space. Uh, And that's really what led me to to start Groundswell. I I came to the conclusion after 12 years at Team Rubicon that it was time to be an entrepreneur again. Uh, I wanted to do something to take the lessons that I'd learned running a nonprofit and find a way to create impact outside of kind of the narrow space that Team Rubicon operated and came up with this idea for democratizing philanthropy, which I'm sure we'll get into to what that means to us. But ultimately, our idea was, you know, we think everyone should be able to give like Gates, uh, get recognized like Rockefeller and get taxed like Buffett. And, uh, you know, that's the <laughs> I love it. I think this is super cool because I think and, and Jared, we've talked a lot about this. When you work with somebody who's been on the other side of that desk Mm -hmm. and had to navigate leadership and performance of a nonprofit and then move into the for-profit side, that is magical. And too many, too many organizations have never served on that other side of the desk. That's right. I'll tell you one thing I heard from uh, one of actually my investors in in Groundswell, one of my early investors. She also, she runs a, her name's Heather Hartnett, Human Ventures. and uh, she also came from the nonprofit space and she said, you know, joke to me early in the process. She goes, Jake, you're going to realize that running a nonprofit was like training with ankle weights on. Oh, so, yeah. <laughs> and the moment you take those ankle weights off, you're going to realize just how fast you can run. Yeah, I, I love that. I and I I have to agree with that. Um, that is a great analogy. It really it really is. So let's get into it then. I mean, with Groundswell's work. Give us some background and some kind of context to what the DAF, uh, you know, ecosystem in relationship to corporate philanthropy, because right now we're seeing a lot of corporate work pulling back, scaling back. And so, you know, we're at even a more interesting time, I think. 
Yeah, well, you know, so you, you continue to reference DAF staffs uh, for, for those kind of curious. It, it stands for donor advised fund. You know, some people are probably familiar with that. What's interesting is that donor advised funds um, have kind of been the purview of the high net worth class for, for decades. You know, if you had a lot of money, um, but not quite enough to justify having your own personal foundation, you had a wealth advisor that probably uh, created a donor advised fund for you as part of your tax planning strategy and to help to make your philanthropy more efficient. And then average people like us, you know, Julia, you, Jarrett, myself, we didn't have access to these. And I saw a lot of people giving to Team Rubicon through donor advised funds. I, I quickly understood just how effective and efficient they could be. You know, I always scratched my head at why other people didn't have access to them. Now, donor advised funds have gotten a little bit of a bad rap over the last couple of years because there are some, I, I guess you could call them loopholes, right? They don't have minimum distribution requirements like personal foundations do. And, and frankly, like I'm, I'm highly supportive of legislation to, to close those loopholes and make minimum minimum mandatory distribution requirements. And frankly, I think it should be higher than 5%. Um, right. We intend to build our product to support that. Um, but what we knew was that a lot of companies think they're really good at giving away money and they're not. <laughs> and I saw that as well. And I raised a lot of money from, from corporations. You know, I, I raised $350 million while I was running Team Rubicon, a lot of it from corporate America. And, you know, what I realized was a lot of those decisions were very centrally driven. I was able to convince a CEO uh, to give us that money. And, and, you know, that decision, while it really benefited Team Rubicon, was not really reflective of you know, the broader employee base uh, in, in all instances. And so that was kind of one motivation. The second thing was in an era of, you know, increasing inequality, why is it that only the executives of these companies have access to efficient, you know, philanthropy tools? So, you know, to cut to the chase, what team, oh, I'm sorry, what is <laughs> hard to break old habits. What <laughs> Groundswell has done is we've built a platform, the world's most modern and inclusive corporate giving platform that provides each employee at a company with their own donor advised fund, and then allows companies to either directly gift or match funds into those DAFs. And so we've provided this, this modern giving tool for employees that they can centralize all their personal philanthropy through. We've made corporate matching programs nearly administration free. Um, and we've introduced privacy into that process because now employees get that money in their DAF without having to disclose to their employer where they're going to give it. And that's really important in a hyper-polarized world where your philanthropy might be deeply personal yeah. and you may not feel like you can actually get involved in your company's matching program if you have to tell them where you're giving. Mm -hmm. right? Because a lot of organizations do have that disclosure aspect or an approved matching gift list. And so I love this component. This must be um, when you look at the landscape of, of your, your competitors and you're not you don't have any like direct competitors per se, but but the concept of this, this has to be one of the more unique functions of what you what Groundswell is doing, right? Yeah, absolutely. There, there are some companies out there that have been around. Benevity, you know, is a kind of a well-known household name, Fortune 500 you know, player, um, but they've really only automated a process. They've made it easier to automate getting the match. And frankly, they're not even really good at automating it. What we've done is we've made philanthropy an employee benefit, right? The, the, the donor advice fund that we give you is like a 401k or HSA for charity. It is your personal giving account. And you can take it with you if you leave your company. Yeah. And so, so really just reimagining how philanthropy plays into a total compensation approach. Mm -hmm. So when you think about, you know, you talked about a drawback in corporate social responsibility. You know, maybe that's inevitable if if this recession hits and you know smart minds are in disagreement about that mm -hmm. but you know i think one of the things we're seeing is that the war for talent is as fierce as ever and so if you take your philanthropy benefit that, or i'm sorry your philanthropy budget that you already have and kind of like subtly repurpose it as a real retention strategy mm -hmm. you know, that's just a smart business tactic right love that i love that concept and I've, I haven't heard anyone talk about a direct link to their labor, you know, protecting their labor force um, in terms of philanthropy like that. That's super cool. Well, I, I want to poke the bear a little bit because I know top of philanthropy today and many other news, uh, you know, media right now, they're really talking. They, we, we even talked about it as soon as we jumped on today's conversation is about 
let's just call it out, right? Amazon smile ending. What have you seen for this space, Jake? I'm curious because I'm poking, like I want to hear it. <laughs> <clears throat> I mean, my, my, my re- response to Amazon smile going kaput is, you know, if a tree falls in the woods and nobody's around to hear it, does it even make a sound? I mean, Amazon smile was frankly a little gimmicky, um, you know, in the history of team Rubicon, you know, $300 million, $350 million raised, we probably got $50,000 from Amazon smile. And I don't think we're alone. Yeah. I mean, listen, it's free money. Like we didn't have to do any work to earn it, but it's pretty immaterial. I would imagine to almost every nonprofit out there. And frankly, I mean, if Amazon's looking for places to cut costs, I can't imagine that this was a real cost center for them. Uh, <laughs> right. So, right. you know, while it, I, while I think it's immaterial to the nonprofit space, I also am left scratching my head as to and to say like, why do you think that this was the, the right move for you to keep your, your shareholder value high? Right. It just didn't make right. sense to me. Yeah. It makes me want to go like, to definitely shop somewhere else, not on that platform. But I am curious. So many people will be bummed of the discontinuation of of Amazon Smile. Are you seeing that Groundswell will be a great alternative and will pick up these opportunities of individuals saying, hey, I want to DAF and I want to like be able to advise where these dollars go. Are you seeing that coming to fruition now? I I don't know that the, the closure of Amazon Smile directly impacts our business. I think, you know, I think what, what does impact our business is that people are looking to give like gates, right? Like I, you know, I kind of said that at the beginning, I, I think people are, are quickly understanding that, that high net worth individuals, they, they, they use different strategies and tactics for everything that they do. You know, right. so one of the advantages of a donor advised fund is that you don't have to just donate cash. Like that's how normal people donate. Rich people don't donate with cash. They donate with appreciated assets. Yep. And so donor advised funds make it really easy for you to do things like, you know, contribute appreciated stock, take the full market value of that appreciated asset as a deduction for your taxes, but not pay capital gains taxes on it. Mm-hmm. So going back to Amazon, like that stock, you know, over the last six months has gotten beaten up. But if you if you bought stock in Amazon five years ago, you've you've 10 x the price. Right. If you want to donate a thousand dollars to charity. Don't go swipe your credit card online and send a thousand bucks transfer four shares of Amazon into your groundswell account and you're not paying any taxes on it. I mean, it's just, again, like that's how rich people give. Yeah. So we want everybody to be able to give like that. So go you talk about, sorry, Julie, you talk about the digital tools and this is really empowering now these individuals, all individuals, as you said, like the average Joe, the three of us, you know, um, And then, so how is this empowering really these donors to have this this ability? Yeah, well, you know, we, uh, uh, so one of the other things that we observed with existing competitors out there like Benevity is that, you know, it's a web-based platform. And, you know, we believe that, uh, you know, one, today's generation, you know, they are, whether good or for better or worse, they're slave to their, to their phone and, and they oh, do yeah. all their banking on their phone. They do they do everything on their phone. And so if you're not a mobile first platform, you're you're losing out, right? So we've we've launched as as the only mobile first employee giving solution out there. And we've built a beautiful mobile app that looks and feels like like Venmo or Robinhood for giving. But you know, it unlocks even more because the, the truth is people are inspired to give in moments, right? They're inspired to give when they pass a homeless person on the street or they turn on uh, CNN over their morning coffee and they see the war in Ukraine Mm -hmm. and it not when they're sitting at their desk logged in through single sign on working in, you know, an Excel spreadsheet like that's not when people are inspired to give. So why are you requiring them to give in that way through their corporate platform? Talk to me about the the size of an organization that would uh, be an appropriate fit for Groundswell. I mean, is this the sort of thing that smaller businesses can get engaged with or individuals or right now are you kind of seated more with that larger larger organization well it's it's interesting because you know the the existing platforms out there i keep talking about benevity and you know this isn't to 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 put yeah. them I, they've done a great job they've pioneered the space yeah. let's be honest like they can only serve an enterprise customer you know, that's, they can't play in the mid-market or SMB space. So we saw that as an opportunity. You know, we want, you know, a small tech startup to be able to give like Google. We want a small law firm to be able to give like, you know, Paul Weiss. And so, you know, we have some enterprise customers. We just took a great uh, 
uh, accounting and tax advisory firm called Whipfleet Live, 3,000 employees. But, you know, we've got customers that are 30 employees. Okay, cool. Because the tech is built to be nimble enough to support that. Mm -hmm. I love it. Got to ask you this question. Do you ever see a time when maybe um, you have nonprofits and, and some of the larger nonprofit organizations um, engage in this? For their yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting that you asked that. So we have, I think, two opportunities within the nonprofit space. So one, you know, there's plenty of nonprofits out there that are one large enough and, and fiercely competing to retain their talent. And yeah. also because they have a fee for service model, they can more easily justify taking some of their revenue and giving it to their employees to give to different charities. Right. I think hospital systems, museums, yeah. things like that. Um, but absolutely, we, we intend to build a full suite of functionality for nonprofits within the next 18 to 24 months. We want this to become a marketplace. Now we have to earn the right to build that. And by that, I mean, you know, we could build all the great, these great tools in the world for nonprofits, but they don't, they don't have enough incentive to come onto Groundswell yet. We're not moving enough money. We have to be moving, you know, north of $100 million a year in order for them to say, oh, I want a piece of that pie. So I'm gonna go create an account with Groundswell and try to attract uh, the donations flowing through this platform. But ultimately when we do build that, what we'll create is, is the most cost effective donor acquisition marketplace on the planet. Mm -hmm. Think about what we'll have. We'll have donors that have capital set aside to give. We'll have data on exactly the types of things that they're interested in. Mm -hmm. And we can help connect donors to nonprofits more efficiently so that we can move that capital better. I ran a nonprofit. I know how hard it is and expensive it is to find donors. Yeah. I want to solve for that. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love it. Love it. Love it. <laughs> Talk to us about... Um, how long you've been engaged in this um is this the sort of thing that you know you with your amazing backstory which is truly remarkable um moving through to being becoming a tech entrepreneur and, and creating this intersection what is that time span what does that look like well it looks like hiring a lot of people smarter than me uh, <laughs> yeah. no, so so team rubicon you know, had a reputation for a few things. One of the things that it developed a reputation for was its ability to lean into technology to execute its mission. So we were a very tech forward uh, organization, did some really incredible things in partnership with companies like Microsoft. And it's not like I wrote, was writing the code. I, I didn't, I still don't know how to write code, <clears throat> but I understood how some of those elements worked. Um, so we were fortunate enough to go out and raise a pretty substantial amount of venture capital money, gave me the opportunity to go out and hire some really smart product leaders and engineers. Um, and what I brought to the table was, <clears throat> you know, my understanding of how to build and scale teams, but also just my understanding of how companies give away money, how people think about philanthropy at an individual level to, to really inform that, that product roadmap and strategy. So. Uh, it's been an interesting journey. Um, the product just came out and came out of beta back in June. So we haven't been out that long, but really excited about the growth that we're seeing and the companies that are going live and democratizing their corporate philanthropy. Yeah, we have um, a question from one of our viewers, Jake, and I'd love to pose it to you uh, really to help better understand you know, regular donations are tax deductible. So what is the advantage of giving in stocks? If you can help us understand why there might be a, a, the difference and, and how that benefits us. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So I'll, I'll start by saying I'm not a tax advisor. You should seek tax advice from a professional. Uh, Good disclaimer, yes. Yeah. You. Um, so, you know, not all assets are the same. So your, um, you know, if you have, a thousand dollars sitting in your bank account and you have a thousand dollars of stock which one is it better to, and that stock maybe had a cost basis of five hundred dollars so it's a it's it's doubled in value you will always want to give that stock instead of that cash now the the, the write-off is the same but the difference is when you give that cash you then have to later sell the stock to pay for other expenses right and when you sell that stock you're going to pay 15, 20% capital gains on that $500 of appreciation that that stock had achieved. But if you donate that stock instead, you still take the $1,000 write-off, but you don't have to pay the capital gains tax because the 
the nonprofit, in this case, the donor advised fund receives that stock, it liquidates it. And because it's a nonprofit, it doesn't have a, a tax obligation. So you basically evaporate the capital gains tax in that. And that's, you know, that's not a, you know, that's not a loophole. That's not a, uh, you know, this, this is just, this is a part of the tax. It it's it's yeah. the function. It's the function of it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. yeah absolutely. You know, one of these things that um, this conversation has gone by so quickly. And, and one of the things that we really want to get you to um, share with us is your, your concept of, and it's not your concept, but I think it's one of the foundational principles, maybe the trust based philanthropy trend and how you are pulling this into your ecosystem and, and moving this forward. If you could talk about that a little bit and share with us how you came to this. Yeah, we were, you know, we've been talking about trust based philanthropy at Team Rubicon for, for a decade. And, you know, we, we, in the nature of our work responding to disasters around the globe, so much in uncertainty and instability in that type of environment, donor restrictions were um, not just onerous from a bookkeeping perspective, but but really restricted our ability to plan and be nimble in the face of like, you know, we don't know where we're going to have to respond next. And so very early on, we we were trying to convince our donors to trust us. Like, we don't know what the, what this year is going to hold. Maybe it's got major hurricanes. Maybe it's only an international earthquake. Maybe it's a civil war in Ukraine. You know, but if you're restricting this these dollars to disaster response in Kansas, but Kansas doesn't have a flood or tornado this year, like that's just sitting on our books and doesn't unlock any impact, you know, in the community. And so we really relied on effective storytelling, effective uh, reporting and analytics. Um, and it really encouraged people to just begin unlocking those dollars and trust us. And, and, you know, I'd say six or seven years ago, we started to see that tide turn where a lot of our major donors moved from these highly restricted annual grants to the same sized annual grants with zero restrictions. And that's really when you saw the organization like hockey stick, like they talk about in startup organizations, because we had the flexibility to take advantage of opportunities without having to delay 30, 60, 90 days to go find new restricted funding for it or go back and beg existing funders to release restrictions. Right, yeah. And speed is of the essence. Now you've started to see this become a trend and one that we welcome. You know, Mackenzie Scott is, you know, the, the queen of this, uh, you know, unlocking, I mean, what's the number at now? How many, however many tens of billions of dollars she's given away and, and you know, if, Thankfully, Team Rubicon was a recipient of one of her very, very generous grants, entirely unrestricted. So it's, you know, it's just a remarkable trend in the space. I think it's the the era of restrictions, I think, was highly paternalistic. Mm -hmm. And and frankly, I actually yelled at a, a room full of venture capitalists when I was starting Groundswell. Um, I was on a panel. Somebody asked me the question. Uh, and it, you know, it related to how having been a nonprofit CEO did or did not prepare me to be a for-profit CEO. And I, I think that's how it was teed up. But I looked at this room full of VCs and I said, all of you are more than willing to cut a $20 million check to an 18 year old that's never built anything in his or her entire life, sight unseen for an idea but you want to write a $20,000 check to a nonprofit entrepreneur who's been slugging it out for two decades in this mission and tell her how to spend it. Mm -hmm. That's bullshit. Yeah. And I don't think they'd ever been spoken to that way, <laughs> but they got it. They got it. And they, and they kind of chuckled. Yeah. They, 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 yeah. they like kind of digested and they chuckled. They were like, you're right. That's like, we don't invest that way. So why would we donate that way? Yeah. So I, I think, I think this is a trend that's a long time coming. It comes back, it makes me think of your ankle weight analogy that you had shared earlier with us. And I do hope that it's here to stay. I know a lot of donors and funders really said, you know, hey, do what, what you need to with our money that we gave you pre-pandemic. Now, you know, it, it, the, everything has hit the fan. We don't know which way is up right now. So you have our money, use it for whatever you need. And I, like you, Jake, I hope it's here to stay because, you know, I'm still filling out grant applications that ask for like 
what is someone's salary and defend that? Why are they getting paid that? And I'm like, are you kidding me? This is still happening today. And these hoops that the funders ask nonprofits to go through are so asinine sometimes. And it's like, it's this obstacle course that God, if you can even make it to the end, like you've done, you just did the American Ninja Warrior course. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So I do hope that it's here to stay. And I would love, love, love to have more conversations about this Mm trust-based philanthropy philosophy. That's a mouthful. Um, And and to hear more about it. So thank you for waving that flag too. You know, a big part of it is education. You know, educating the donor and the the corporate partners to saying actually this is a better way to invest your money yeah. than you know if you if you come to uh you know the table and saying we're only going to put x number of dollars a certain way in our business that's not a, a good way to run a business right not. So we need to understand you know that that nonprofit piece of it well this has been really an exciting opportunity um for us jake to have you on the nonprofit show to really um, see the beginning of the story journey that you've been on. Um, Obviously your work and your leadership with Team Rubicon has informed so many other nonprofits and and so many donors, frankly. Um, So to see you um, navigating this concept, we're gonna really be excited to see how um, you grow and how it moves forward. And I'm telling you, I really love the idea of engaging nonprofits with teams and having this become part of their ecosystem for to, you know, retain and protect their labor. I love this concept. Awesome. Well, thanks for having me on. Uh, it was a quick 30 minutes. I hope I didn't say anything that keeps me from getting invited back. <laughs> <laughs> it goes fast. In fact, we had one of our viewers write in and say, in quotes, that's not the way you invest. So why would it be the way you donate? I'm going to be quoting that. So uh, you definitely landed for a lot of our viewers and our listeners today live, and I'm sure you will even more so in the recording. So Katie Warnock knew what she was doing when she said, hey, you got to talk to Jake. Make sure you get Jake on. So thank you. Of course. Thanks, Katie, for making the recommendation. (laughs) Yeah, it's been great. Hey, check out uh, Jake Wood's new company, groundswell.io, and learn about not only his product and the service, but the philanthropy and the philosophical side behind it. I think it's a great way to engage more sustainable uh, relationships with those individuals. And it's, I feel like Jake, this is, you're writing a, a tide of, of change that is so needed and so exciting in, in the nonprofit sector. And so, um, you know, we, we like to remind everybody that approximately 15 million Americans go to work every Monday to a nonprofit. And hopefully Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday. Yeah, this is true. <laughs> this is true. But, you know, that's a hell of a lot of people. That's a hell of a, a lot. lot of Americans. And yeah. you know, more than 5% of our GDP is invested, you know, or is, is circles the nonprofit sector. And so this is a super cool thing to, to be talking to you about. And definitely we'll want to have you come back. Again, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. been joined today by the nonprofit nerd. Jared R. Ransom. She's actually my nonprofit nerd first, but like she said, we can share. There's so, plenty. Yes. There's plenty to go around. Hey, we want to thank all of our pre- presenting sponsors from Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, Be Generous, Fundraising Academy at National University, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, and the Nonprofit Nerd. These are the folks that allow us to have these amazing conversations like we've had with Jake Wood and Groundswell each and every day. So Jake, I'm really looking forward to what's going on with you um, and to see this business of yours grow and flourish and help our sector. I appreciate that. Thanks for having me on. Wish us luck. Got Got a lot of work ahead of us. Anyway, hey everybody, have a great day. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Thanks.